Welcome to this episode of Substantial Matters, Life and Science of Parkinson's. I'm your host, Dan Keller. At the Parkinson's Foundation, we want all people with Parkinson's and their families to get the care and support they need. Better care starts with better research and leads to better lives. In this podcast series, we highlight the fruits of that research, the treatments and techniques that can help you live a better life now, as well as research that can bring a better tomorrow. Our last episode with Dr. Joe Quinn of the Oregon Health and Science University, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence, focused on hallucinations and how to treat them. Today, we continue the discussion of sensory misperceptions in Parkinson's disease. Hallucinations, illusions, and delusions can all occur in people with PD, especially in the advanced stages of the disease. They can interfere with your everyday activities, and they might be scary. But they are treatable with coping strategies and medication adjustments, so it's important to talk about them if you experience them. There is even a new medication on the market that may help. Dr. Martha Nance is the director of the Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence at the Struthers Parkinson Center in Minneapolis. She identifies four questions for you and your healthcare team to think about when figuring out the best way to manage hallucinations. And she says, while hallucinations may affect any of the senses, most often they are visual. So people will see things that aren't really there. Often it's people or animals. People with Parkinson's can also have things that are sort of a variation on the theme of hallucinations, something that we might call an illusion. The classical illusion would be a mailbox that looks a little bit like a short person. And a more disturbing kind of false experience that a person with Parkinson's can have is a delusion, sort of a false belief, the sense that somebody's spying on them or that there's infidelity on the part of a spouse. So the main ones are visual, but they can also have auditory paresthesias, those also? Yeah. So as I said, commonly, interestingly, it's visual symptoms, but some patients will have a feeling of things crawling on the skin. I had one patient who had a funny taste in their mouth that would come on at certain times of the day, and she was also convinced that somebody was trying to poison her because of this funny taste that she would have. So it was accompanied by this sort of paranoid or suspicious thought. Possibly for good reason, <laughs> if you're having a taste that yes, it, yeah. you didn't induce. Are the hallucinations mainly from the drugs to treat Parkinson's, or does the disease itself involve them? It can be really a combination of both. So what's interesting is that most people with Parkinson's don't develop hallucinations until a number of years into their course, 10 years, 12 years, or even more. If hallucinations begin right at the beginning of the disease course, right at the onset of the motor symptoms, we actually use a different name for that. We call that Lewy body disease. So in people with the more typical Parkinson's disease, hallucinations develop later on probably partly due to the total brain injury or the effects of the Parkinson's disease on the parts of the brain that create these images or create our perceptions. But all Parkinson pills, all of the pills that we use to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease will tend to promote hallucinations. So it's often a combination of both. Is it worthwhile trying to separate out the origin, or it doesn't matter whether it's the disease or the drugs? At least the drugs you might be able to modify, I would think. Sure. So the obvious question, how do you treat a hallucination? And the first thing that the neurologist would think of is to cut back on any unneeded medications that might be contributing to the problem. Of all of our Parkinson pills, levodopa is probably the most effective at treating the motor symptoms and maybe somewhat less likely to trigger hallucinations, whereas some of the other drugs, such as amantadine or the MAO inhibitors like selegiline or risagiline or the dopamine agonists, some of these other drugs are somewhat more likely to promote hallucinations. So sometimes the best treatment for a hallucination is to cut back on some of the Parkinson medicine. Do people tolerate that well? Do they then have more motor symptoms? It depends on the patient. And I often talk about prioritizing 
the symptoms. So I think most people, if they had to make a choice between moving a little bit less well, but having a clearer understanding of the world around them versus being able to move a little bit better, but seeing strange people in the room, I think most people would rather be more clear headed and put up with a little bit worse movement. Plus, sometimes people are on medications that they've been on for 10 or 15 years. And as the disease progresses, they then add other medications on top of that. And it may be that the other medication that was added is doing 98% of the work. And that medication that you started 15 years ago, you really don't even notice it if it's not there anymore. So sometimes you really can get away with taking away or at least reducing the dose of one or another of the Parkinson meds. Besides changing medications or doses, are there coping mechanisms? Can people deal with them even if they're having hallucinations? Sure. As with every other aspect of Parkinson's disease, the details are critical. And I think there are four questions in particular to sort of ask or think about as you're understanding hallucinations. One is whether the hallucinations are occurring at a certain time of day. Or is it all day long? Well, we all hallucinate at night. We just call it dreams. And so I leave a little more latitude for people to have funny experiences during the night. Sometimes people will have a pattern where the hallucinations escalate in the evening. And other people will have hallucinations all day long. That might make a difference in how you treat it. Are the things that you're experiencing close by here in this room? the strange man standing in the corner, or is it some kids outside across the street with balloons that other people don't think are there? So things that are here in the room are inherently more threatening than something across the street. Number three is, are the things nice things or are they scary things? So I sometimes keep a little puppy dog in my office. You can't see him, but I kind of like having him there. He keeps me company. He's my pretend friend, and I like him. But the six men with knives standing in the corner, and one of them is under the bed, I'm going to call the police. So are the things I'm experiencing nice or not nice or sort of neutral? And then the fourth thing is kind of an interesting aspect is whether the person experiencing these things knows that they're not real. So I know that my little pretend puppy that I keep in my office is not real. I had one patient who was cooking an elaborate meal for 10 every lunchtime because this group of construction guys would come over. They were nice people, but they would expect lunch. And her husband could not convince her that it was just the two of them in the house. And so that was a problem. So those are the four things I think are really critical to understand. Does this really need pharmacologic treatment, or can we just talk about it? You know, let's look under the bed. No, there's nobody there. Okay. You know, can you be reassurable, or do you have insight or not? So what do you advise patients or their care partners to do about this? Absolutely. The number one thing is I advise them to talk about it. Patients and their caregivers, I think, are afraid to mention it to the doctor because they're afraid the doctor's going to think that they're crazy. And I think that they don't understand that this can be part of the disease itself or it could be something that's partly caused by our treatment. And there are actually things we can do about it. So if reducing medications doesn't help or reassurance doesn't help, there are medications that we use to treat hallucinations. What sort of medications are those? The classic medications that are used are fall in a category called antipsychotic or neuroleptic medications. And what's interesting about those medications, they all share in common that they block the effect of dopamine in the brain. So the big problem with those drugs is that they could make your Parkinson's worse. Mm. Not the disease process, but could make the Parkinson's motor symptoms worse. So we've always struggled with which of the known antipsychotics has less tendency to make the Parkinson's worse, and we all have our favorites. None of the antipsychotic medications have been shown to be better or worse or more effective or less effective in Parkinson's, but doctors have used them for a long time. But the one new thing is a new drug that was just approved in 2016. It's the first antipsychotic drug that doesn't work through dopamine. It works by altering the levels of a different chemical called serotonin. So it's not going to make the Parkinson's symptoms worse. And this drug was approved specifically to treat hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. The name of that drug is pimavanserin. So that's available and is the first drug that was specifically developed to treat hallucinations in Parkinson's. 
Do you have experience with it? How well does it work in the real world? I have a very small experience with the drug because it's fairly new. And I think like all drugs, it's not going to be perfect. It can have side effects. One of the interesting things that I've found in the small number of patients I've given it to is that it may take a while for the drug to work. So you need to kind of work with it. Don't expect that on day one, the symptoms are all going to go away. The other thing is the symptoms may not all go away completely anyway, but the six men with the knives right here in the room may go outside and there may only be three of them, and they may not have knives anymore. So again, if you think about those four questions, as hallucinations improve, they may not go away, but they may become less threatening. Any final watchwords or advice? Again, I would just reiterate that it really is important for people to feel comfortable talking about this with the doctor because it is a treatable problem. It's a scary problem when it occurs, and I think it's doubly scary if you're afraid to even talk about it. But if you do talk about it, there are a number of things that we can do to make it better and really improve the lives of both the person with Parkinson's and whoever else is living with them. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Hallucinations are a hot topic these days, and the Parkinson's Foundation has many free resources to help you learn more. If you didn't listen to our previous episode yet, start there. Find it at parkinson.org podcast. The episode is called Do You See What I See? If you prefer a good read, get your copy of our title Psychosis, which you can find online at parkinson.org books or by calling our helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. Our PD information specialists can direct you to these resources and more, including an upcoming webinar taking place today at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Don't worry if you miss it. All past Parkinson's Foundation webinars are available at parkinson.org slash expert briefings. Our helpline specialists can also tell you about Parkinson's Foundation research on psychosis and help you find healthcare professionals with experience in helping people deal with hallucinations, illusions, and other behaviors. If you have any questions about the topics discussed today, or if you want to leave feedback on this podcast or any other subject, you can do it at parkinson.org feedback. At the Parkinson's Foundation, our mission is to help every person diagnosed with Parkinson's live the best possible life today. To that end, we'll be bringing you a new episode in this podcast series every other week. Our next episode will cover the who, what, when, where, why, and how of brain donation, and it will air during Brain Awareness Week, which is March 12th to 18th this year. Follow the Parkinson's Foundation on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for updates. Till then, for more information and resources, visit parkinson.org or call our toll-free helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. That's 1-800-473-4636. Thank you for listening.